but uh, it kind of changed the perspective that you have. And I just wanted to have maybe a little talk about um, what is happening in the startup scene when it comes to like uh, AI development, um, good things, bad things, uh, things that need to improve, and maybe it can give you like maybe an overview of what does this field look like from an industrial perspective. Um, this is not going to be a technical talk, it's going to be mostly like um, work related. Well, I'll just use the that is fine. Um, so I think that maybe it's a bit important to maybe have a, a question about like what kind of projects I had the opportunity working on. Um, this can give you an overview of like what is out there in the AI field for industries. So as I said, when I was here in Spain, I was not working in this field. Um, I was primarily focusing on what the cool kids were doing back then, which was cloud computing, digital systems. So I was working for a French company that was involved with the Spanish government uh, to provide a smart city in Barcelona. Uh, we went from like road traffic, uh, weather information, the start of the beaches, and all the way up to like emergency response uh, when it comes to uh, terrorist attacks. So this was mostly not an AI project, it was like a data processing uh, project, I would say, that the challenge was in like, we have all these different sources of information that each one of them uses a different standard, a different uh, way to access, and how can we conglomerate all this information to one unit that we can use for the citizens, which was in this case alerts. Um, fast forward, um, when I was studying in, in, in Sweden, um, I really got into uh, the field of machine learning a bit, and I was also interested in psychology. So what this brought me to, um, it was to a research topic around emotional recognition uh, for the National Institute of Computer Science in Sweden. Um, so what you usually do is that basically you have these special landmarks that are useful for detecting what is the expression in your face, and then you can use this information to detect whether you're happy, you're sad, um, you're surprised. The research topic, um, probably some of you know about some frameworks for like emotional recognition that are very available online. And, but the problem is that they are single frame based solutions, which means that basically they process this information frame by frame. I was thinking that maybe uh, adding the temporal dimension to it could extract an extra uh, that dimensionality for the predictions. Because when you become happy, when you become sad, it's not something that happens like instantaneously. It's something that there is a motion encoding in your face when you go from normal state to happiness and so on. Um, that was the research topic at the Institute. Um, I ended up working uh, as a freelancer uh, during my studies, and I had the opportunity to work with a startup called FacePCO, which was uh, focusing on um, helping people with facial paralysis through exercises. So when it comes to facial paralysis, it's like basically how your face does not have like a nervous response uh, to your will. And what these people have to do is really go to the doctor, um, do some exercises, which is like forcing some of these muscles as they can. And you can kind of gamify this with these landmarks. So you try them to like align, mirror their face with the muscles. Kind of a gamification uh, kind of thing. And next, uh, because of the thesis and overall like the GitHub repo that I made, um, I was randomly discovered by a startup in Munich. And that's when I started with my first full-time job. Um, the startup was focusing, uh, was still focusing on like human behavior, which was like a no-brainer for me. Uh, that was what I was interested in. And they were focusing on like monitoring drivers for automotive. So what we were doing is that basically Mercedes cars uh, in the last generation, they come with a built-in camera, also Daimler trucks, and you can actually detect whether the driver is sleepy, drowsy, or drunk based on the facial expression analysis. And for example, in the case of being drunk, you can just decide not to start the engine. Um, if he's sleepy, uh, you can decide to just take on an autopilot and just make the car stop by. So, personally, it's interesting. Um, when it comes to the human behavior, you can transpose this like landmark estimation into the entire body. So, the other project that we were working on, um, it was primarily uh, safety in factories. So, we were using this landmark estimation to kind of like crop areas of the body from people. And you could use this kind of like key points to basically see what people are wearing in the factories. Are they wearing the safety equipment? Are they wearing the safety goggles? Um, the non-conductive boots? And 
basically having this camera set up in a factory, you can autonom autonomously uh, monitor for safety. Because what you usually have in the normal settings is uh, um, basically a person that is responsible for monitoring each section. So you have a person that is literally just looking at how people are working. So really exciting stuff. That was my, I would say, my first full time involvement in startups. Um, next thing, uh, last thing that I was working on before coming here to Barcelona, um, I was in a different startup, which was not really a startup, but it was like a subdivision of a big company. Um, basically, the trade was completely independent, but of course, all the funding um, resources came from the parent company, which which, which is Shidata. Um, they focus on like control access systems in ski resorts, um, uh, parking access, and so on. But the problem with that particular topic is that um, there is no more ski resorts being open. So it kind of like your market starts flattening out, your revenue starts flattening out. So they decided to go with a new product, which uh, for which I was one of the first uh, deep learning engineers, which was automated checkout for restaurants and, um, and canteens. What you usually have is that basically one, uh, you go with your tray, uh, basically you pass it through and there's a person in the cash, as a cashier that is looking at what you have in your tray and just puts in the bottoms, uh, tells you the price, you pay and you go. Uh, we were fully automating this with a camera. So instead of doing this, you would just go with your tray. The camera was able to detect portions, uh, which foods you were using, match this with a backend for the product uh, list and give you a price, you swap your credit card, that's it. Saves money from the perspective of the company, that doesn't have to hire people for doing, I would say, this kind of like uh, automated job. And second, it speeds up the entire thing, speeds up the lines and everything. Um, they're currently working with IKEA, with FC Bayern for the, uh, for the football um, stadiums and so on. And the thing that excites me the most, and the reason that I'm here in Barcelona is because I recently joined a different startup. Um, their name is AstroScreen, and we are trying to detect uh, social media manipulation. Um, it's a big topic, it's a big problem. There is many different companies trying to attack, to attack it. Um, we have reached a point in which uh, social media is only present, meaning that doesn't matter what you do, uh, there will always be something in social media about you. Um, you interact with your phone all day. Um, it's really easy to change your mood based on what they show you. So we, we thought that it was, a, it was a huge problem to attack. So the way that we approach this is through two different, I would say two different verticals. Uh, first, we have this machine learning aspect, which we try to model this fake behavior um, based on spread patterns, uh, fake accounts, um, topics that are being inorganically enhanced and on the other hand, we have analysts that basically act as our client base uh, at the beginning. They can improve the product, they can come up with like, okay, actually there is this, this information campaign that is happening. They can analyze it and come up with new, uh, new ideas on how to attack this problem. So from the technical side, um, what I usually work on in this sense uh, is trying to detect, for example, when there is a topic in Twitter that is like uh, really growing up or exploding, it's becoming viral. You can definitely see in the patterns of how this is shared among the network, whether this is uh, organic activity or inorganic. When you have organic activity, uh, it spreads nicely. So you have the origin of the tweet, an author, they, this author is followed by X people. These X people find the engaging, and after some time they retweet or they like and so on. So it's like this kind of like thing that basically follower retreats, these other follower retreats, and so on, so it spreads very nicely. Then you have these misinformation campaigns that they completely uh, destroy this. So you see basically an author being in a tweet, just random notes popping up everywhere uh, that are not really related to this author, and you can use these spread patterns to tell whether something is um, inorganic. So you have seen all these like different applications and this has been only four years of work. So I would say that if you have this, the tools to make it, there is, it's very easy for you, for you to get into like new fields. 
Um, before, two months ago, my entire background was in perception, as you could see. I was based on computer vision, sensors, and so on. It was the first time that I actually jumped into like the social networks. But I would say that after doing all these different projects, all these different products, um, there's always some patterns or some steps that you can use in every single one of them. And that's something that I came up with. Um, I would just like to understand, um, how many of you have used machine learning in any way in your uh, work? It can be as simple as like importing scikit learn. That also counts. Okay. Okay, so it's a great majority. Okay, awesome. So I'm sure that many of you can relate somehow to these steps. Um, maybe, uh, so when, when you attack, try to attack a learning problem, um, I would say that I always attack it in this way with these steps. It's much easier if we see an example. <coughs> Sorry. So two weeks ago, I was starting to work on this uh, toxicity analysis for the members of the parliament in the UK. So what is happening right now with all this Brexit is that there is a lot of uh, activity in Twitter in different social networks regarding the members of the parliament. And one interesting, one interesting aspect of this is that you can maybe uh, uh, use the sentiment of the tweets in, a, in order to, uh, to identify coordinated activity. Meaning that maybe there is a set of users that in coordination are trying to uh, threat, insult, uh, attack certain members of the parliament. And through that, maybe start a topic or a thread talking about this, uh, this particular attack. So the first thing when it comes to my machine learning is like defining the problem. What does your company or product need as an output from a model? In this case, um, as a vertical, we need this toxicity classification. We want to know whether a tweet is an insult, is a threat, um, is it being toxic, is it toxic, is it identity hate? So you define what is going to be the input for generating that body. In this case, it's like letters, so text, I would say, in the, in the smallest of the, uh, of the representation, just yes, letters. So first thing, when it comes to like coding, uh, prepare the data. You need to get the data somehow. If you're lucky enough, uh, there is data sets out there. If you are uh, unlucky, then you have to generate your own data, label your own data. Um, so the first thing, collection. Um, I would say that that's one of the most important things when it comes to machine learning. The more data you have, the better your model will be. Um, always data overcomes the model. So you can have the worst model ever. If you have enough data, that would be the best model. That would make it the best model. So collection is definitely um, something really important. Um, in the case of social networks, the problem is that the APIs, because of these, uh, all these controversies for the last couple of years, have been being more and more limited. You can access every day less and less information from the users. I would say personally for a good reason. Um, so we have to find a way around it. Uh, which means that maybe the APIs do not provide us what we need, so we need to start web scrapping. So in our case, we use a, a mix of both. We use both APIs, uh, web scrapping, in order to get the data that we need. Once you have all this data, you, you start to you need to start uh, cleaning it. Um, the most basic uh, thing that I can think of is like trying to remove all these characters that do not provide value for the task at hand. Um, in this case. Uh, maybe, actually emojis, maybe that do make a little bit of sense because they transmit certain emotions. But I really just want to remove um, everything that does not add value to your, to your learning problem. Um, then, labeling. Um, if you have a data set, awesome. You don't, have to, you don't need to label. If you do not, then you have to use resources. Um, companies usually use interns for this. We don't. Uh, but uh, I would say that Labeling um, is also becoming a big industry by itself. Um, never in Europe, never in the US, because it's way too expensive to pay somebody. Unfortunately, this mostly happens in third world countries um, or countries with low income, because that's when actually it becomes profitable for the companies to pay for these labelers. But there's a huge, huge industry behind it. So one, once you have the labels, then it comes to transformation. Uh, you want to prepare this data for your model. And this is the way. Um, 
uh, is token tokenization, which means like splitting the text into like individual tokens or words. And if you are not using deep learning, um, we usually make fun of this now because when deep learning came out, like the, all this feature engineering became less and less requiring, and it was one of the biggest tasks for a data scientist back then. So you want to remove, basically, you want to focus on the feature that you are really, really sure that will make your model uh, uh, obtain the maximum of efficiency. The reason that because you do this, sorry, the reason for you to do this um, is because the less dimensionality you have in your input, the easier it is for the algorithm to learn. You need less data in general. So just reduce the amount of data that you need. You want to remove the features that are not useful for your task at hand. As I said, um, in deep learning, maybe this happens a little bit less. Um, I hardly ever do feature engineering uh, because basically deep learning is a technique that actually already deals with this stuff. It's able to isolate the feature that finds unimportant, finds uncorrelated with the output that you want to get. Next thing, you have to choose a learning, a learning algorithm. algorithm. Um, I would say that nowadays this is already not state of the art, BERT is excellent, uh, as he mentioned. Um, when you choose the learning algorithm, you just usually do research, um, find the papers, what's the state of the art, um, which kind of competitions uh, are relevant for this task, and which techniques do they use. Um, then you go to the training, which is more the automated process. Um, you just have to pull a few lines of code. Um, then you evaluate the performance, which can go as easy as like just calculating the accuracy of your system. Sometimes you have to go deeper and see like why is it failing in certain scenarios, which is called error analysis. Just to try to improve your model over time for the uh, next step. Uh, improving results, as I said, you can do error analysis. Um, or you can do hyperparameter optimization, which is setting these parameters that cannot be learned directly from, from, the, from the data. Once you have a good enough model, or you pass things that is a good enough model, um, you have to deploy it. You have to make it available for either customers or the scientists. And for this, um, some people have servers. I personally always rely on the cloud because it's much nicer when it comes to bandwidth, uh, resources. Is it to scale? Is it to scale? So you can just deploy the model with a REST API, so customers or your own products can make requests for your model. Um, even though in some cases it does not make sense to have it in the cloud because you need like real time response. So you, sometimes you have to have your own device with the GPU um, for performing these predictions. And then you have this feedback loop. So once you are have your model deployed, this is not the end of it. Um, just start that you will keep improving this model over and over again over time um, until rarely happens that you have 100% accuracy. <coughs> Another important point uh, when it comes to like the development, you have to define your metric early on that you want to optimize. This might seem um, obvious, uh, but I personally think that it's not. Uh, sometimes you think that your metric really defines what your product should be doing, but sometimes it doesn't. For example, in computer vision, um, most of the metrics are based on mean average precision, which, I mean, in normal words, it basically estimates on um, how accurate is your center of prediction and how good the bounding box is in respect to the object. It's the most easy way to go and most logical thing to do. But to give an example about tracing, um, we do not care about the bounding box that much. We just want the products to appear. We want to detect the products. So we heavily uh, rely more on the detection, uh, meaning that the, if the item is present in the picture, it should be detected, rather than the bounding box. The bounding box can be completely off, can be big, can be small. Um, from the product perspective, you do not care about that. So even though you might have a model, maybe it's still the R model, that generates a much better mean average precision, maybe you'll find out that the product, your product works uh, your product uh, works worse for this reason given, given. So really early on you should define what are you trying to optimize to be able to like improve this over time. Next thing, when it comes to developing a product, um, machine learning is such a small thing. Um, if you're a machine learning engineer in a startup, 
chances are that you will not be doing machine learning more than 10% of your time. Um, personally, in my case, I would say this, this is slightly even lower. Um, I maybe spend 7%, 5% of my time doing machine learning. The rest is doing all these other stuff that you see there. Um, because the machine learning code by itself is just a model. Um, for the previous slide that I showed you, like data collection, uh, deployment, all this is like, I would say, data collection is more like data engineering, and deployment is more like software engineering. So you want to make a um, uh, RESTful API out of this. Um, you want to create a server, you want to create, create a client that can access the server, and so on. So as I said, um, unless you are working in a very research-oriented uh, topic, which many people end up doing for like big corporations, and they end up like using much more machine learning than anything else. Um, chances are that you're going to be doing other things. <coughs> One of the points of developing for a startup is that you have limited resources. This means that um, usually um, it's rarely to be found that a startup has like a game break, sorry, a break for you in research. They usually use open source. And I would personally argue that um, when you see the market share for the startups, um, you see that they, there is a huge gap between the rest of the markets and there is a leading sector, which is IT and software. You could argue that this is basically because software is such a omnipresent thing or is something that is growing for the last few decades. I personally would say that the reason that this innovation is happening is because um, software is this immaterial good that can be transferred so easily through open source. When you build an industrial startup, you need resources. Uh, you need to buy motors if you are working on like some vehicle. Um, you need physical goods, but cost money, cost resources, and take time. When it comes to software, you just clone a GitHub repo and you have already the resources that you need. So this availability of open source definitely plays a huge role in the fact that there is so many software or AI startups. If there was no TensorFlow, there was no PyTorch, there was no Keras, um, there would be nothing close to what we have today. Next thing is that algorithms become obsolete. Um, things that maybe you know in one year, in the next year they're completely irrelevant. This is what happened back in 2012 with the classical computer vision NLP researchers. They found themselves that basically deep learning this very I would say simple compared to classical CV, classical NLP, um, was outperforming by a huge margin. So everything that you knew before about like all these like quadruple derivatives, quadruple integrals for computer vision, they are completely um, out of the picture. They can be relevant. And as knowledge, I would say that it's still relevant somehow because it tells you like about the story of how we got here, but from the practical side, it's completely useless. Um, so that's the thing, uh, you have to keep up with research. Um, BERT was released in the late 2018, it's already obsolete because ExcelNet became still the art uh, one month ago. So you have to keep up with research and try to improve, uh, keep, uh, keep up with the changes that happen. So maybe moving more towards the business side. Um, there is great things about startups, but there's also some things that I personally would like to share that maybe become useful for people that are starting in this, uh, in this field or that's trying to work for startups. Because you have to get used to smell the bullshit. Um, so I have like three different, three small things. I already, I actually have 10, but I want to write an article. I don't have time for putting the 10 here. Um, so first things, <laughs> Um, are these things about proprietary machine learning. Um, if you go to a startup web page, uh, usually you will find some of these sentences. Um, I can translate it to you, what it means. Um, our state of the art algorithms means that they clone the GitHub repo. <laughs> and for AI products, uh, basically means that they have a lot of MVPs, uh, they have a lot of prototypes. Um, I would say that it's extremely hard to come up with one product when startups come, come up with like saying that they have like a line of products, uh, that means that they have a line of projects. And let me tell you that from prototype to product is a huge, huge gap. Um, it's about this rule of 95%, which means that getting to 95% of accuracy or like a product is super easy. Getting the extra 5% takes years. 
Um, of course, there is companies that they state this and it's true, but I'm just talking about the majority. Um, sometimes when the founder, one of the founders is technical or has done research, it's can be much more likely. Um, award winning. Um, again, I can maybe translate this into English. Uh, probably if you follow some startups or actually I would not even say that this is startups, it's like maybe companies as well. Um, you see a sentence about like certain startup being nominated to be the top X of certain domain or sector. Um, what this means behind the scenes is that um, so this startup or this company went to exhibition or a conference uh, in these kind of things uh, you uh, interact with a lot of people, there's people from the press by press I mean that maybe there's some companies, tech companies that also do press as a side business and they talk with these startups um, they talk with the founders and so on they exchange contacts in this exhibition um, sometimes it passes and then there is a call so a 30 minute call between the press and the startup they talk for 30 minutes, what they do, what fields are they in, things like this. And at the end of the call, uh, they, the press has like a set of companies, sometimes 10, sometimes 15. And they try to come up with 10 or 20 rankings. Meaning that there is like a, a hand, there's a few uh, companies for a few rankings, which means that becoming first or second is completely uh, meaningless. Um, and that's how they do it. Um, they come from the side of the company, they get uh, ex, uh, exposure through the startup because the startup shares like, hey, we have been top one, top two of the sector in this industry. From the side of the startup, they get recognition, which is fake recognition, but um, still uh, being talked about you is better than not being talked about you, I would say. And last thing, uh, the money. Um, many scenarios you will find that uh, most startups say that they have uh, paying clients. Let me translate this to you. Um, what this means is that when startups join accelerators, um, they get in contact with industries. They get in contact with enterprises. These enterprises have a budget for innovation, and some of this budget goes towards scouting what is their what is the technology area. And for this, they end up like running pilot projects with startups. They run pilot projects with startups because they want to know what is the state of the technology, um, they want to know what is the market, what applications are being developed. So kind of like getting to learn from a startup. So in the best case scenario, this pilot project becomes actually a pain client, they become a service provider. It's really hard for that to happen. But I, would, I personally would say that anybody that works in business, they will tell you that a client it's not somebody that pays just once and that just leaves. You want a client to be coming back to you to gain a cash flow into your company. And one time payment for a pilot project is not a client. To close it up, um, after this maybe a bit more criticizing aspect of the talk, um, I just want to show maybe a few of the latest innovations in the industry. So products that have been used uh, through AI that I personally feel like they can be really revolutionary. So first thing, uh, this is not even from this year, it's from last year. Uh, Facebook released this uh, approach for dense post estimation. Do you remember what I showed you before about like the key points in the body? This takes it to the next level, so it's actually able to model the surface of your body, 3D. And maybe an operating application of this is that basically online shopping is becoming a more and more uh, um, dominating the market. Um, most people shop online already, and if you can actually include the clothing uh, brands into it, then you are a winner. Um, this basically can enable that. You can actually scan the surface of your body and try clothes on by just using a camera for the online retaining, among other applications for sure. Um, creativity, I'm sure that many of you already have seen that thing on the top. Um, basically, taking a single screenshot from somebody, you can actually make them talk. Um, this thing normally is called deepfakes, but deepfakes is one approach. Um, one of the latest ones was like actually face-to-face, -face, which was like 
uh, I can take a few pictures from somebody and using the visual landmarks and some generative models, I can make him say whatever I want. And um, in the second case, you can see this uh, Gaugan from NVIDIA. Basically, using low level sketches, you can generate high quality pictures. Um, how many of you heard of GANs? So, for the ones that don't, uh, basically there's two different types of uh, machine learning that you can apply. One that is discriminative, which means that you go from an image to a set of features or a set of properties, or the other way around, you can actually generate images from a set of properties. That's what GANs do. And I would say that that's the creative aspect of AI. The problem with this is that as any other kind of art, um, there is limited uh, practical applications. Um, GANs have become hugely popular in uh, social media, they became hugely popular in, I would say, um, social media in general, sorry. Like porn? Good yeah, also porn. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a big industry. Uh, def like definitely there is, a, uh, there is a lot of uh, hype around it, but the reality from the industrial perspective is that they have limited applications, um, meaning that you see them everywhere, but when it comes to like companies, nobody uses them. Um, because as I said, it's kind of related to the kind of like the bad part of art, which is like the practicality of it. Um, it's also to look at a beautiful painting, but when it comes to like practical applications, a painting has no value. It's about the you as a person as perceiving that painting. And that's one of the issues why gas are not so much applied in the industry. Um, I would say one of the last things, uh, interpreting uh, what the models say. Um, the problem with deep learning is that it's a black box method, meaning that you cannot formally interpret what do they learn. And some people argue that this is a blessing, some people argue that this is a, uh, a problem. Um, I think that both sides are correct. From the side of thinking that this is a problem is because we cannot tell why do they infer the things that they infer. Uh, meaning that if I, if this, for example, there is a number that is a six and I classify it as a two, um, there is no formal way for me to say like why exactly it was misclassified. misclassified. From the good side, uh, I personally think that as individuals or as humans, um, even ourselves uh, being intelligent beings, uh, we are not able to formalize or learn the experiences. Um, let's say that you see a bubble, and when you see this bubble, um, you don't, go, you don't uh, consciously go through the process of identifying it. You automatically know that it's a bubble. And then I can ask you, like, why is this a bubble? You can tell me, like, yeah, sure, the shape is this way, uh, this kind of material. But then I can ask you, like, why, what is the shape? Okay, this set of edges around the area. The texture, why is this texture uh, of a bubble? Why make, what makes it that texture bubble? You can go deeper and deeper, and at some point, it already breaks. Um, they can explain the next step. And I would say that that's, I, I don't know if there is going to be a scenario in which these models are going to be able to be formally interpreted, but um, it's definitely something that even ourselves lack. <coughs> Last thing, a uh, reason that I joined this company, uh, basically optimizing what we, what, is, what we see on a daily basis. Um, it becomes more and more easy every day. Uh, recommender systems have become out of hand, and you can you can move the masses with absolutely anything. Um, nowadays, buying a misinformation campaign costs a little as little as two hundred dollars, meaning that for two hundred dollars you have about fifty people that can actually go as far as like protesting about something for you. And it, it's it's simply because we are we are on their phone on our phones all the time, and being on our phones all the time shows us a simplified version of ourselves. Um, when you are a person in the physical world, you may think that everybody is different. Um, each person has their peculiarities, they have their thoughts, they have their ambitions and everything. When you interact with this person through a mobile phone, through the screen, it's a simplified version, it's much easier to manipulate. And in one hand you have all these optimization algorithms trying to show you what they want, or show you what the advertisers want. And it's becoming more and more of a problem, and it will become a huge problem. When you talk about AI, usually you see this doom about like super intelligence happening. I think that is is much more realistic that uh, social media consumption becomes the doom. It's not like this super intelligence. 
uh, fear mongering, in my opinion. <coughs> so, conclusion, just one minute. Um, summary takeaways, um, I can give you five points. Um, first of all, uh, when it comes to like joining in general startups, uh, do not look at the titles, do not look at the prestige, um, they mean nothing. Um, everybody can be a great engineer, everybody can be a great seller. You really need to share something with those people. Um, you need to share the passion that they have for the product, you have to share the education that you can put in your work, and you, can, you have to share the vision that they have. Um, I would say that's the most important thing. Because the idea is just one small thing. Um, it's about the application of the idea that makes a startup successful or not. Second, um, if you want to become a, a machine learning engineer, or you're already one, um, you might already know that basically most of it is not machine learning. Um, software engineering and analytics are also in the plate, mostly software engineering. Um, because of this, machine learning is a, only a small component of the entire product. Um, unless you are a very specific person for like data modeling specifically, um, or you are working as a consultant, or you are working for a startup as a consultancy, uh, chances are that machine learning is just a small component. There's much more to it. Another type of startups are the ones that basically they have talent, they are experts, and big companies buy this. <coughs> companies it is much easier for them from an HR perspective. And that's what it usually happens with the research oriented startups like DeepMind, Fabula AI a couple months ago, he got bought by Twitter. So it's about not buying the product or the research because the research is already available, but it's about buying the team. How would they push it or learn from it? I did a bit of both. Um, and as I said, don't limit yourself, as you could see, like, um, don't limit yourself to one domain. Explore and take advantage. Um, there is so many applications out there and this field is growing. Despite of the hype, there is definitely a lot of applications that can be done. And yeah. Hope the best. Thank you. So one quick question while I change the laptops. Don't be shy. No. Good one. Daniel, can you tell us about your transition from computer vision to NLP? Sure. Um, I would say that from the practical experience, everything that I did in computer vision was still relevant. I just had, had to read a lot and learn a lot about different domain. Uh, meaning that, for example, I did not have experience with word embeddings. Um, the last time that I did NLP was back when I was in Spain, and that was like very basic word organization using NLDK. I don't know if any of you know the library. But I would say the most important thing is about being open to learn and learn fast. I think that that's a property, not just for startups or like switching domains. Um, if you want to be relevant over time, you need to keep improving yourself. It's not, it's never enough uh, for what you know. You always need to keep learning. Sometimes you can do it progressively, keep it in the same field, or sometimes you can just take the jump and just try something new. When I started data science or uh, machine learning, I did not have prior experience to it, and always takes a lot of time to start with it. But I mean, if you have education. Um, Everything is global, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.